Hello, everyone. Welcome to another round of our TeamNet Colloquium. And today we have the honor to uh, have as a speaker, Marco Tomamiko, um, who received his um, Master of Science in Electrical Engineering and Information Technology from ETH Zurich, where he now sits at the moment, actually. And then he also got a PhD in 2012 from the same university, but from the um, from physics. At in physics at uh, the Institute of Theoretical Physics at the same university. And after getting his PhD, he worked as a lecturer at the School of Physics of the University of Sydney, and then as a senior lecturer and associate professor at the University of Technology, Sydney. And since 2020, Marco is an associate professor at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and a principal investigator at the Center for Quantum Technologies at the National University of Singapore. And um, Marco's research lies at the intersection of information theory, computer science, and quantum physics. And he focuses mainly on the mathematical foundations of the theory of quantum information. And the, one of the subjects he's famous for is the study of quantum information processing under the constraint of limited resources, uh, about he, which he wrote a great book. If I have it with me, even quantum information processing with finite resources, I, I invite you to, to get it, to read it. Uh, but today he's not going to tell us about this, but rather he will tell us about uh, his nature physics paper from 2020 entitled Quantum Advantage with Noisy Shallow Circuits. Marco, the floor, the screen, not the floor, it's yours. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation and the nice introduction. Um, glad that we, we met when we, when we were both uh, in, in Sydney. So yeah, this, this work, as you said, is, is a bit um, out of the the usual things I do, but maybe you'll see why, um, what the connection is. So that there are actually some ingredients from more information theory or, or maybe uh, communications and non-locality that, that come into this problem, which is actually in the end trying to, to tackle a computing problem. So we'll, we'll, we'll see that. Um, good, so yes, um, so generally, uh, please feel, Free to, to interrupt and ask questions. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to uh, reply at any time. Good. Okay, so, so, so maybe the, the, the main question that maybe all of our field is concerned with at the moment is how do we convince uh, skeptics that quantum computers work, which, mean, which means that they actually do something useful that classical computers cannot do? I mean, if they just do what classical computers do, obviously that, that wouldn't convince any skeptics. Now, it turns out that this is very challenging and, and I'll give a little bit of, of, of background information about why, uh, why this is so challenging. But in fact, um, a related problem is quite simple and we, we've, we've um, done this uh, already many times. So it's easy to show that multiple quantum computers give a quantum advantage. Right, the, the Bell uh, violation is the proof of this. You cannot get a Bell violation with two classical computers uh, that are separated and cannot communicate. And the idea of this talk um, is to somehow get take some of the ideas that we, we have from there, from um, this non-local games uh, setting, for example, and try to use them in the computation setting to, to uh, answer kind of the first question. Um, proving an advantage for a single quantum computer. Okay, so that's kind of the, the basic summary of, of, of this talk. So if you, if you remember one thing, then this should, should be it. Using tools from non-locality in, in quantum uh, to show quantum advantage. Um, good, so, so the plan um, is that I first start with some, some background, really putting this work a little bit in context. Um, and then we, uh, I'll show you how what we did, and 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 I hope to give you an intuition of, of how the the proof of this separation works, and uh, and so we'll go through through that. So it's it, it's going to get more technical as we go along. So the first part should really be a, a general introduction into into the topic. So first we kind of need to define um, uh, some terms. So, and, and this is actually not as, as simple as one would think because um, at least in this talk, I, I'm gonna make a difference between 
this quantum computational advantage and quantum computational supremacy. So whenever uh, there's a discussion about these two terms, then people propose that one should choose, should just use uh, advantage instead of supremacy. But uh, here I'm actually going to define them very uh, differently or somewhat differently. So a, a computational advantage is a property of a class of computational problems. Um, you can think of them as, a, as parameterized by the length of the input. And what you want uh, to have is that um, as you scale up the input and, and look at large and large instances, um, um, for this class of problems, a quantum computer um, is asymptotically more efficient than, than a classical computer. So maybe one scales with uh, exponentially in the input size and the other one uh, somewhat sub-exponentially. Uh, or, or as we have with, with Shor's algorithm, the classical one is believed to be uh, sub-exponential, but, but larger than polynomial, and, and then the, the um, quantum one would be polynomial. But you need some, to have some separation, and, and that gives you a, a class uh, of problems that have a uh, quantum computational advantage. Good. Um, and then quantum computational supremacy is, is what we kind of want uh, to show to convince a skeptic. Um, so there's John Preskill's definition, uh, which is essentially uh, the day when, so it's about a, a point in time, uh, when well-controlled quantum systems can perform tasks surpassing what can be done in the classical world. So we can try to make this a little bit more formal. Um, these things here are not uh, very formal. We'll, we'll get more formal as the talk pro progresses. Um, but an attempt to make it a little bit more formal is to, to say uh, that, well, this is just rephrasing. It's when uh, a quantum computation advantage is realized experimentally. But what does this mean? Um, so what you need as ingredients is, is a class of computational problems exhibiting a quantum computational advantage. But that's what you start with. Um, but then you need also to show that this class of problems is robust under noise, right? Experimentally, you will always have uh, some noise. So you need to show that this uh, asymptotic gap is um, um, robust in the presence of noise. So this, this um, obviously is kind of, uh, in, for many problems, this follows from, from um, um, uh, just fault tolerant techniques, fault tolerant quantum computing, which tells us that if we, if we want to make uh, uh, they have noise under a certain threshold, then by just adding a logarithmic overhead, essentially we can we can get rid of of this noise and and, and make the, the effect of this noise arbitrary small. So for for many problems, um, fault tolerance actually immediately gives you the second um, property. But this is less clear for for some of the other problems that are considered to show um, quantum computational supremacy. Uh, so we'll get back to that. Um, and then uh, the third part is obviously we need a large enough uh, programmable quantum computer to solve instances of the problem that cannot be solved classically with, with current technology. So the question then is where, where we are we at, uh, at this? Uh, and, and actually, this is kind of, to some degree, a, a moving um, target um, because uh, when I first made this slide, um, we, we kind of believed that we, we had achieved quantum computational supremacy um, because of the Google experiment. But now very clearly, actually, we, we, we haven't. Um, and so, so the, the, the target is moving because essentially we, we get better and better at classically simulating uh, quantum systems. So what happened is that we had this Google experiment that claimed uh, quantum computational supremacy. And, uh, but now actually it turns out that the instances that they were able to solve uh, are not large enough. They, they can still be solved with the uh, current technology on a classical computer due to improvements in, in, in algorithms. I mean, these improvements were kind of inspired by this Google experiment. So um, 
But still, in, 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 in the sense I defined it before, this con computational supremacy has actually not yet been achieved. So this is still, or is again an open problem. Um, okay, good. So um, let's now try to get a little bit more formal. Um, so we can take a, a complexity theory perspective on this problem. Um, so we want to show a, a quantum advantage of some um, for, for some problem. So this is here. This slide is, is is to say that this is actually extremely difficult, and we are unlikely to be able to do that. Um, and the reason for that is just uh, complexity theory. So there are open problems in classical complexity theory, um, which would be solved if we could show a separation between quantum and classical computing. And this is, um, or polynomial time. Um, uh, so when I say computing, I mean polynomial time algorithms. Um, and this is because um, this class of, of, of problems that can be solved with quantum um, polynomial time algorithms is contained in P space. Uh, so we can solve that also on a classical computer um, with only using polynomial space, but potentially exponential uh, time. Um, essentially, you just, yeah, I mean, it, it's the, the reduction is not that simple, but you can imagine that you just try out different paths of the computation um, and you only need to, to kind of store some um, uh, polynomial amount of, uh, you only need a polynomial amount of memory to keep track of your, your algorithm. Um, but uh, so, so you can simulate quantum computers um, in P space. Um, but we don't know whether P space is actually different from P, so from, from classical polynomial time um, or BPP, which is kind of the, the analog of, of PQP, so probabilistic polynomial. Um, so in, in fact, if we could show a separation between B, BQP and P, uh, then we would also show a separation between P and P space and, and thus solve a, a longstanding uh, classical problem. So, so this is, a, a, is an issue and then kind of, it tells us that, well, probably we should try to take another path. Maybe this is not the, um, the way to, to go. So we cannot outright show a, a separation. And uh, a lot of the, the work then is, is about, well, how do we avoid this issue? Um, they are just so uh, to connect maybe to some other um, recent um, results. So what I said before is, is, is kind of, if you have multiple quantum computers, then it's relatively easy to show a separation. And we can also see that in a, in a fully formal complexity theoretic way. So if we have just, um, so in, on this uh, first side here, we just have a, a single uh, prover and a single verifier. In that case, we know that um, these interactive proofs and quantum interactive proofs actually uh, have the same power. So there, there's no advantage in using a quantum um, uh, prover and verifier. Um, but if we go um, again to the case where we have multiple uh, provers, then there is a difference. So this, the, the respective classes, um, MIP and QMIP, uh, they are different. And this has been recently actually only shown that there is uh, formally there is this difference. Um, but again, the kind of the idea is if, if you have multiple quantum devices, then then um, we can show gaps and even even um, uh, complex theoretic gaps. So that's kind of um, yeah, just a final piece of of, of background here. Good, okay, so so let's uh, move closer to the, to the actual topic. Um, of sorry, Marco, can I ask about uh, the, the previous slide? Sure, uh, if you don't ask me what all the abbreviations mean. <laughs> yeah. So just uh, on the high, high level, this, this, this breakthrough, I mean, I mean, I mean, okay, there is this, okay, in some sense separation between quantum and classical, but it doesn't, if I understand well, it doesn't concern like, uh, problems that quantum computer can solve, let's say, efficiently, right? Or, or 
um, if I can. So it's like a separation, but kind of in a sort of uh, kind of uh, far away from like polynomial time quantum computation, right? Um, well, I, I mean, usually in this in these interactive settings, the, the verifier is polynomial time, so that uh, that is true also also here. But the prover is un, unbounded, so yes. Um, okay. So so in in that sense, it's it's not. Um, uh efficient right the prover is not efficient uh, but the verifier would be yeah yeah okay. thanks for clarification um okay so so now um yeah let's talk about ways to get around this this impasse um so and then there are kind of two uh, maybe main ways to get around this that have been discussed in the literature so the first one is um, the one that's been been taken by Google, for example, in the quantum supremacy experiments. And there you essentially, you just need to make some complexity theoretic assumptions that kind of creates a separation. So um, while the weakest one you, you certainly need is, is you need to separate P and P space, but, but obviously you can take stronger separations uh, there, right? I mean, uh, one trivial separation would be induced if you say that that factoring is is uh, is uh, hard um, for classical computers. Um, but but um, the, the assumptions that they're making are, are kind of more um, generic and have a lot of support in in com complexity uh, theory itself. But they need to 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 make some um, some complexity theoretic assumptions. And, and under these assumptions, they can then show that certain problems are indeed difficult for uh, a classical computer. Um, and those problems are potentially easy for a quantum computer. So, so this uh, includes uh, boson sampling is, is of this form um, and kind of the, uh, there is, um, yeah, this, this random, um, random circuit sampling that, that Google uses is another example of this. Um, so these are often sampling problems. And it turns out that uh, they are, you can pr find problems in there that are feasible with NIST devices in two dimensions. And on the some additional assumptions, they can even tolerate some, some noise. Um, and so, so one can uh, really have um, a separation there under, under some assumptions that, that most people believe are, are reasonable. Um, the other path is the one that, that I'm going to talk about in this work, is to just avoid the problem altogether by looking at um, questions that are all uh, polynomial time. So we are actually looking at, this, uh, uh, we're kind of splitting up uh, polynomial time even more and look at, at easy problems in uh, polynomial time and, and if there is a separation there. So this uh, is called shallow circuits. So essentially we look at circuits that are only uh, either constant depth in the, in the problem size or logarithmic depth. Um, and uh, in the quantum circuits we look at are even uh, Clifford so that so they can they can be simulated in, in polynomial time on a classical computer is no problem. Um, but the separation that we want to show is between uh, um, constant and logarithmic. So essentially we want to show that there are some problems that can be solved um, in constant depth by quantum computer, but take logarithmic depth for a quantum computer. Um, so, so it's a clear separation, but it's kind of inside, it's all inside P, so uh, it doesn't violate any of the um, uh, uh, complexity theoretic, uh, or it doesn't encounter any of the complexity theoretic problems that I just discussed. And the problems that we are going to look at are relational problems. Uh, in re relational problems, uh, the, the point is that you have uh, several inputs and, and, and output bits, and those just need to satisfy some relation. So, so maybe for, for a given input, uh, there are multiple outputs that are valid. They just need to satisfy certain uh, constraints. 
as you can write a, a function that defines whether a solution is, is correct or not, the function of the inputs and outputs. Um, and so for a given input, you just want to produce any of the outputs that satisfy this. Um, yes, and um, so the status of this, which we will see is that we can, um, we can define um, problems that, that can be uh, solved with NISC devices in 3D and, and tolerate noise. Um, but the, the, the thresholds for this noise are far from, from feasible at the moment. But in, in principle, the difference here is that this really does not make any assumptions, uh, complexity theoretic assumptions, right? We, we, we don't need these assumptions because we, it's all in P anyways. So we don't need to, to avoid this complexity theory impasse. Okay, so uh, with that, we, we, we get to the, the, the actual work I'm, I'm gonna discuss, which is this paper with um, Sergey, David and, and Robert. Um, and um, I'm gonna spend most of the time, I guess, on, on, the, on the noiseless case, because there I think I really can, um, I hope to at least um, explain to you the ideas that go into it and, and why this, this works. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so, so stop me when I, I'm going uh, fast or, or something is unclear. Um, so first, uh, this is the, the actual um, result or formal result. Um, so we have this um, uh, natural number n and for each n we, we can create a relational problem that acts on roughly n inputs and outputs. Um, and for, for this, uh, there is a set of inputs, which is just a size polynomial in N, um, such that the problem given by this input can be solved with a quantum computer of constant depth. So, so the quantum computer will always give you an output that satisfies the, the required relation um, in constant depth. And, but any classical circuit uh, that uses constant fan in gates and solves uh, this relational problem with high probability must at least have logarithmic depth. So this is the, the separation that, that we are able to show. Um, so this is um, it just from the, the history, maybe uh, I should have mentioned this. Uh, well, here you see that there is an original paper quantum advantage with Charles circuit by the, the other authors of, of, of this paper. Um, so there they already showed this first result, um, um, the noiseless case. Um, the difference was that they, they needed a 2D circuit um, to do this, whereas ours is, is 1D. And it's just simpler. Um, so uh, I think at least for me, uh, I think this, this simplification then allowed to to create also the, uh, noise robustness. Good, okay, so, so what do we need uh, to understand this, this construction? The first thing is, is the magic squares game. Uh, I hope you, most of you are familiar with magic squares. Um, so the point is that Alice and Bob need to fill a random uh, column or row. Um, so they get that as an input. Um, and they need to fill them with, with plus and minus one so that uh, the columns multiply to minus one, the rows to plus one. Um, and they need to, the outputs that they create need to be consistent. Um, so, so they will overlap at one point, and at that point, they, they should output the same, uh, either plus one or minus one. And it's kind of, I mean, from, from this picture, you can maybe already believe that classically this is difficult to solve because um, even if they communicate beforehand and, and come up with some strategy, um, the strategy would consist of, of such a, an assignment in the table, um, right? But there is no consistent assignment. Um, so if, if these um, parities need to be satisfied, then, then there's at least one element where they cannot agree. And uh, so that the column and, and row parity uh, are different. Um, 
this is, to 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 see this you just check that if you if you take uh, multiply all the numbers here then the two two parity conditions actually contradict each other so they cannot be a consistent design and thus uh, you you can win at most with probability eight over nine classic um, good but uh, in with quantum mechanics we know that we can win this game uh, with certainty um, if Alice and Bob just share two maximally entangled states and then do particular measurements on, on, on those states to create the different outputs. So here I introduced some notation that we will need later. So the, but the inputs are, uh, should be the index of the, the row or column. So that's a number between one and three. You're just in, in binary notation. We will need actually later on also the zero, zero input. So that's why we chose this. Um, and uh, the outputs are, are the, the bits as we've seen, and then we have, we can define the winning conditions for this game. And one can verify uh, uh, that these measurements here uh, give you, um, um, allow you to win with certainty. Okay, but I mean, the details are, are not so important. Um, the, the, the thing that we, we can do now is, is we can try to make this into a computation and a relational problem. Uh, so the simplest way is just to uh, just play this as a, as a circuit, essentially, um, where um, there's a classical input. Um, so alpha and beta would be the input for Alice and for Bob. And that determines kind of a rotation which brings you in there into the right measurement basis and then and then you just do the, the measurement so so this circuit um, will always produce inputs and outputs uh, that satisfy the the relation the, the magic square relation right so this is easy to to do quantumly with this circuit um, but it's too easy um, because it's also easy for classical computer to to do this in, in, in constant depth. Uh, I mean, this is just a, a simple computation, right? Because the classical circuit has obviously um, access to both Alice and Bob's input and can then just produce some, some output that is consistent with that. Um, Sorry, uh, I, I didn't quite get the relation between the, the, the outputs of the circuit, I mean, it, and its inputs with the original game that you presented. Can you just? Elaborate. Well, so so the the magic square games assumes that Alice and Bob are, are spatially separated, right? So they only get uh, input alpha or beta, uh, and then have to produce outputs x and y, and x and y are these three bit strings. Now, here it's just the same, but just written as a as a circuit. So what the circuit does in the first part is it creates these maximally entangled states. Um, and then it just rotates into the correct basin and does a measurement. This measurement now gives you the first two bits. And um, what we do is we set the third one so that the parity condition always holds. Um, so, okay. so that creates you the, the, the same input and output. And, and then you, you, you know that this is satisfied. Um, the, the kind of the third measurement is, is superfluous because um, um, they're commuting measurements. The, the three measurements in this, this list are, are commuting, and that's why we can actually do them, all, all three of them. So the result of the third is always a function of the, the previous two. Thank you. Um, okay, so we have a circuit, but classically this is also trivial because you, you can just look at both inputs and, and produce an output that satisfies the relation. Um, so we need to make this more, more difficult. And we, we, we saw, I mean, the, the reason why magic is difficult is because we have these locality constraints. So what we can do um, here is kind of uh, just input these uh, inputs, the class of inputs at different locations of the circuit. So we kind of, you, you can think of this, this uh, as a big chip with, with multiple inputs and, and outputs. And now if you just uh, separate 
input and output, then there is kind of a light cone of, of how far information can flow uh, in a constant depth uh, circuit when, when the fan in is, is also restricted. So every gate can only have a constant number of, of inputs. So, so kind of your, your, your the inputs can only spread so far. Now, we don't want to assume anything though about um, what the internal structure of this circuit is, classically. So what we need to do um, is we cannot just put them at, at, at fixed locations, the input and output, but what we can do is put them at random locations. So a, a part of our input is uh, which, where the, the real input for the magic square game goes. Or um, what we will do in, in, in the end is we either input zero, zero, if, if it's not really an input there, and if we put in 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1, then that means that's actually the input for the magic squares game. Okay. Uh, we will see that when, when we look at the circuit again. So this makes the problem harder um, because now um, you, you can really use this light cone argument to see that, that the inputs and output cannot, cannot be known at the same uh, position, like the, the, the light cones will not generally overlap with high probability. Um, but... Sorry, so you ask something quickly. Sure. Um, you said about constant uh, fan in constraint on the gates, but it, you also do assume some geometry here, right? I mean, it's not that they, they have just two inputs, but like that there is some geometry that there is some mm, bits are closer than others, right? I mean, yeah, it's kind of in the picture, it, it, I assume this, mm -hmm. but actually in the proof, we don't assume this. That's why... Um, uh -huh. Um, yeah, the picture is oversimplifying it. Right? Okay. That's why we need to assume that, uh, or we need to put these inputs at random locations, because if you put them at random location, for whatever fixed geometry this, the, the mm -hmm. ship has, with high probability, the light cones will not overlap. Ah, uh, I see, okay. This is like, if you fix first the location of the inputs, then, then you can, can always find the geometry exactly. that okay. they kind of uh, overlap. Okay, thank you yeah. for clarification, thanks. Yeah. Um, but this is now, the question is now, well, can the quantum uh, circuit deal with this, right? Because now the, the quantum circuit also has input coming in at, at the random locations and, and can we now um, solve this problem still in constant depth? So that's um, gonna be the, the next step. And then the ingredient uh, we use there, that's where kind of the, uh, communication uh, part comes in is the entanglement swap. Um, so the idea is that uh, what we do is when we get the input, we just swap the, our entanglement that we locally generated in such a way that now um, the two Alice and Bobs are, are in the end entangled. So that's kind of the idea. We can create entanglement locally between neighbors uh, and then use a, a swap to distribute it to the right parties. So that's the, the basic uh, idea. And I mean, this is just a, a circuit for um, entanglement swap. Now, the point here is that um, if you remember entanglement swapping, um, you have to do a, a measurement in the um, poly basis the, sorry, in the, in, the, in the bell basis. And then you have to do a correction depending on, on what the measurement result is. Um, and um, this is a bit of, of an annoyance because we don't actually want to have an interactive quantum circuit. We really want a constant depth circuit that is not, um, that doesn't do any uh, operation conditional on, on measurements. Because if we, if we do that, it, it it uh, becomes much more powerful and, and actually more difficult to implement. Um, so we, we don't want to do this. And, and that's kind of kind of the, the, um, the topic of, of this slide. So, so now what you see on the right hand side is, is the actual circuit um, for this re relation that solves this relational problem. So we've seen before this U and Vs, they um, are responsible for the, um, for the measurements of the magic squares uh, game. 
And, and again, the, the first part here is, is just creating local entanglement between neighbors. You see that all, all the neighbors kind of create this. Um, and then there is now this additional part, uh, the blue one, which does the entanglement swap. So what happens is if the input between uh, for, for A1 and uh, alpha 1 and beta 1, or sorry, no, beta 1 and, and, and alpha 2, actually, if it's both 0, 0, which means that those are not used as the inputs for the, for, the, um, for the game, then what they will just do is swap the entanglement. So then they distribute it kind of further apart. OK? And the way they do is they're just doing this measurement in the bell basis. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this is just a measurement in the bell basis, what this does for two, two pairs. So that's why it's, it's four uh, outcomes. Okay, and now what one would need to do is, is depending on that measurement outcome, one would need to do local rotations. Um, but we can't really do that. So instead, what we just do is we play the magic squares game uh, still but now with the wrong state. So what we know is that conditioned on, on an outcome there, we, we know that now Alice and Bob will share some Bell state. Um, it's just to figure out which one we would need to, to look at all the measurement results. Um, and it turns out that this is, is not really, oh, uh, what did I do? Sorry. Um, yes, so this is not really a problem because of this, this property of uh, the Clifford group. Um, so all the, 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 the circuits, all the, the things we've done, and in particular the, playing the magic squares game, um, these rotations that we had to do are all Clifford gates. And what we can then do is, because Clifford gates kind of allow us to translate through um, polys, um, we can, um, in a sense, once we know what the state was that we played with, we can update the winning condition to reflect this. Um, so we can translate the, the, these poly operations that map us between different Bell states through the, our magic squares game and then just update after measuring, update the, the winning condition. So that is um, um, what we want to do. And, and uh, I mean... Um, I'm sorry, can I ask about the SAS part, this update of winning condition? Uh, yes. Like, so just, uh, okay, on high, I mean, on high, on high level understood what is going on, just this update, like you don't, you. To realize this update, uh, don't you need to do any kind of communication between the uh, kind of be uh, bits, like kind of in the post processing? Uh, I mean, because you would, I understand that you want to keep things local still. Yeah. Um, yes. So essentially, what it does is it gives us a different relational problem, right? Um, what we're interested in is a relational problem. So there is a condition between the inputs and the outputs that needs to be satisfied. Uh, but the outputs of our circuit actually include anyway all the measurements we do on uh, for this teleportation. So we then just have to kind of uh, do a computation on all our outputs uh, and check the winning condition. Uh, okay, so like basically you like maybe you if, if I understand well, you you lift this relation just from the single magic square that was placed kind of randomly uh, there to kind of uh, to accommodate for the situations uh, like this when the interpretation that, that you had to do correction and then uh, kind of other outputs also matter basically. Should I understand it like this? Uh, so okay, maybe maybe I can explain it. On I mean, this is the 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 problem actually formally written down and maybe it will become clear um, 
uh, what it is, right? So the input so important starting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think um, I, I, I can explain it better with, with the, after I do this. So um, the inputs are really just a J and a K, which is a, a number telling you which uh, players are playing, where we assume that, that K is Bob and is larger than J. And then we have the inputs that they receive. So that's the structure of a, of a valid input to this game. And then we require that the output satisfy uh, this relation here, which um, essentially, so this is the, the product of, um, of the two um, outputs for the magic squares game, right? They, they're index X at index J and K. Um, and um, for those, we would usually require that they are the same. So their product should be one. Um, but now we, we have a different condition on them. So maybe so, sometimes they are uh, actually need to be different. And that depends on um, what the actual inputs and this S, T, S prime and T prime. And this, this S, T prime, uh, all these, these variables are essentially what you get from, from the teleportation. So you do teleportation many times, so you kind of uh, have to, you know, take a product of, of the outputs you get, um, and uh, and then that that determines what kind of state you end up with between Alice and Bob. So these products, and that in turn determines what the winning condition is. But it just gives you a different relational problem in the end. So you don't actually have to compute this during runtime, right? You have to compute it in order to verify whether the output that is generated is a valid output. Um, so if you want to check whether the quantum computer works, then you would need to do this computation. But in order to define the problem, you, you can, it's just a different problem. Thanks. That's it. Okay, good. Um, so now I, I skip this, but I, I think I already explained um, um, what this is, it's just the point that all the bell states can be written as uh, just poly rotations of, of the original maximum entangled state. And that, that, that's kind of yeah, part of this argument. Okay. Um, um, and now, okay, so we have defined kind of a different relational problem. Now, this, this I'm going to um, just quickly glance over. Uh, we, we then have to show again that this is still classically hard, um, but but this one can do by another reduction because essentially even if Alice and Bob can um, determine what state they actually play with as part of the output, so they can determine their winning condition uh, by specifying what state they play with, uh, even then the problem is difficult, assuming that they cannot specify the full state, but but uh, only have access to to part uh, control what part of the bits needed to to specify it, and then one can essentially by a loud con argument then argue that they don't have more control over choosing the state. So so that is just to show that even this this variation of the problem is still um, classically hard. And so then and then we are uh, we we're done. We have shown a separation. Um, um, because um, because of this light cone argument, we know the problem classically uh, needs at least logarithmic depth. In logarithmic depth, you, you the, the light cone fills out the whole space, so then you don't have this um, separation anymore. Um, but below logarithmic depth, um, uh, you would with high probability. Have, have no overlap over these light cones, and, and that's why it's classically difficult. Um, and the, the quantum circuit that we use for this is, is really as, as simple as it can get. Uh, uh, probably, I mean, it's, it's depth five and, and geometrically local. So actually, we only ever need gates between next neighbors in this whole um, circuit, which is, is very useful. Um, and uh, yes, the, 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 
the, the thing, uh, the largest thing that we do is, is classically control two qubit gates. Good. Um, yes, as a, a complexity theoretic uh, separation, one can uh, see this as, as showing that, that there's a problem that is in um, NC0, A is not in NC0, so there would be constant depth um, classical circuit, but is in, in QNC0, which is a constant depth quantum circuit. So, so the people have already also defined complexity class for these things. And for those, one can now show uh, separation. Or, I mean, the original work already did this. Good. Um, so I have a bit of time left for the noisy case. Um, and uh, I mean, there's some interesting um, observations that also go in, in here. So the next step was then kind of to, to, to see whether this problem survives when we add noise or disadvantage survives when we add noise to the quantum circuit, not to the classical one. Like we're still comparing to noise free uh, classical circuits. In, um, and um, what one can show or what we can show is that under a certain noise model, which is, is quite general, um, it just assumes that errors, poly errors that are uh, that have um, are correlated between many different locations, uh, those are exponentially suppressed in the number of locations that are, are correlated. Um, so that's the, the noise model. And we show that in, with this noise model, um, we can still, we can get a, a um, and a robust version of our our quantum circuit uh, or, or of our problem that cannot be solved by a classical um, 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 computer in depth log n essentially. Well, it's log n divided by log log n. But, um, and the quantum circuit can still do it in, in constant depth. So, I mean, the first thing to explain here is, is why can we not just use uh, usual fault tolerance techniques. Um, the problem is that uh, the, we want to keep obviously the noise parameter uh, constant. So as we scale up the number of qubits that we are using, this would um, uh, give us an overhead that is logarithmic in the number of qubits at least. Um, so even just to prepare a ground state of an, uh, um, of an error correction code, uh, would usually uh, would require a logarithmic number of gates. And, and since we want to do it in constant depth, that kind of rules it out, right? Um, so, so the usual fault tolerance technique here uh, doesn't uh, really help us. Um, okay, so, so we need to find uh, another way of doing this. Um, and the kind of the point is that one can obviously, essentially we have to rewrite the whole fault tolerance uh, framework for, for our system, um, but with uh, an additional property of the code, namely we need what is called the constant depth, single shot logical basis state preparation. Okay, so the, the actual um, gates that we need to do or just Clifford gates. So we, so we have nice, uh, there are nice codes where Cliffords are efficiently implementable in, in, in certainly in, in constant depth. So that's actually then not a problem. The only problem we have is preparing the ground uh, state or logical, logical zero state, for example. Um, and um, we need to assume that such a, a, um, a method exists of a, of a particular form, namely, that we do, uh, we, we take um, uh, qubits in the zero state and some ancillas in the zero state, then do a polynomial depth, um, sorry, constant depth, not polynomial, constant depth circuit on it, measure the ancillas, and then we need to do a, um, some recovery operation on our quantum register. And after the recovery, we would be in the, in the logical zero state. So we need something of this form. And this is actually, this exists. So one um, 
famous um, example is this, this Rausendorf construction of it using a, a cluster state where essentially um, you have like this three dimensional um, object, well, in, in, in terms of uh, locality, then you do some measurements on the bulk of it and you end up with a, a, a surface code, uh, an, an entangled surface code actually between the two surfaces. Um, you just don't know what logical state you're in. It's again, um, that will depend on, on what your exact measurement outcomes are. So then you need to do some, some local corrections to, to bring it into your uh, uh, ground state or in this case, like the, the singlet state. Okay, so, so there are um, constructions like this, which, um, 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 one can use, um, and, and they have this, this form that we require. And maybe you can already see what will happen with this, um, because it's, it's kind of essentially using the same trick that we used before. Um, so instead of doing this recovery, oh, I should have said this recovery is, needs to be poly, needs to be a poly operation. That is important. And so now maybe now you can see uh, what will happen to this uh, recovery operation. Essentially the point is we're never gonna do this recovery operation um, because that might be, um, um, it's not gonna be a constant uh, depth operation necessarily. What we're gonna do instead is, is we're just gonna commute this recovery operation through our whole circuit and, um, and update our relational problem to kind of do the corrections uh, depending on, on what measurement result we, we, we got there. So we can transform uh, a constant depth uh, Clifford circuit into a fault tolerant or a, with a relational problem uh, into a fault tolerant uh, relational problem that now uses uh, this construction. So, so it, it will, um, prepare, uh, apply this W and then and measure the syndrome. Um, but instead of doing the recovery on the syndrome, we just continue with the circuit that we already have. Um, and, um, um, but, but now obviously applied in, in, the, in the logical space. So, so we need to translate into the logical space. And then at the end, um, interpret our outputs by, by using the syndrome information, essentially commuting the polys through there. Um, so, and then, okay, there is this uh, uh, formal reduction that we can then do, um, but this is not so, so important. Um, uh, essentially, yeah, this just tells us that, um, this makes, doesn't make the, the classical problem easier. Uh, um, by this, this fault tolerant version of the problem is still classically difficult. Um, sorry, can I, can I ask what, what it means to solve a, uh, like, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, I, I don't, want, don't understand if in the case of noise, I mean, I understand you want to suppress noise, that's why you are doing all those gadgets. Uh, but still, there will be, I mean, there will be some noise suppression, but it will be still there. So uh, there will be some errors uh, uh, corresponding to this relation you are effectively getting, if I understand it right. So in what sense, like what is the, uh, in what sense a uh, quantum computer will be solving this relational problem? So like how one quantifies, uh, you know, if there are some inevitable still errors, I understand. Um, yes, so, right, so, so if you have the error correcting a code, essentially, uh, you do your computation, um, then you measure um, your, well, you, you measure in the, um, in the encoded space, so in, in, in the uh, physical space, or, and essentially to get the logical bit out, 
you use all that information you get from these measurements to do the error correction, right? Sure. Um, so, so you have to, in, in a way, the output to get the logical output, uh, you need to use all, all of these measurement results of all the, the qubits in the... Uh, so, so that's where the, the error correction actually happens. No, still no, no I, I, I understand this, but still there will be some uh, probability of error, right? So, uh, no, I, I mean, I understand on like high level what is going on, like, because you... Oh I, yeah, you, you still get a probability of error. So, so if you see, if you um, see the result here, it's now that the con computer cannot solve with the probability one, only with probability 99.99. Uh, so okay. essentially you can, I mean, you can make this probability arbitrary close to one, but you cannot bring it to one. And if you want to get it closer and closer to one, you need to add more and more. Um, so you mean that the, the the algorithm would output the, let's say the the output uh, that would be such that uh, together with the input, uh, you will satisfy the relational problem with probability at least, uh, let's say, yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, can, can I just uh, ask a follow up on this very quickly? So, you, you, in order to get the correct answer, you need to use all the data from the error correct from like the syndrome measurements. But then, isn't this the fact that the number of the syndrome measurement grows with n, and then to multiply n numbers, you need a circuit that somehow grows with n and is not constant? Um, so the number of um... Yeah, so the number of, of qubits that you need will grow with n, yes, but not the depth. So uh, the point okay. is you can still do it in constant depth, but, but the number of qubits will yes. be, uh, I, I think it, it's poly n. Okay, thanks. Uh, does it say, it says roughly n. So maybe it's actually just a multiple of, of n that depends on. Hmm. This time I'm actually not hundred percent sure how much overhead you get in terms of number of qubits, but yeah, it should grow. Uh, it should grow with n. But kind of the main point is that the depth doesn't grow. Uh, and okay. you just yeah, you just measure them all, and 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 the uh, relational problem will will get larger. So it must be that. That maybe it's only logarithmic in in n or so the growth. I'm I'm, I'm not sure because it, it depends on on how the the errors can propagate, right? But actually, um, the errors cannot propagate very much because we are only constant depth. So so maybe it's really just a constant times n that's sufficient for this. Uh, but this I'm I'm not 100 percent sure anymore. Yes. Okay. So. Um, Good, okay, so that brings uh, us to the conclusion. So, so now just, as I mentioned, this, this quantum supremacy problem is still um, somewhat open. Um, now, does what we've done here um, add anything to this picture? And I guess the answer is not directly, at least, um, because the, the problem is that um, this is all provably a provable gap, but we need to uh, to actually show um, um, a difference, right? Uh, you have multiple problems. I mean, the first is that actually it's not very difficult to get logarithmic depth classical computers. So to actually show an experimental advantage, uh, uh, you probably need, I don't know. I mean, N needs to be, uh, Really large for this to, to become problematic for for classical computing. So 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 maybe that's that's I mean, uh, the gap is is really in a sense too small to to experimentally demonstrate this. And the other issue is that we have noise tolerance, which is theoretically nice that we 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 can show this. But actually, the tolerance is is I mean the, the one we can prove is is very bad. Right, so the, 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 we cannot tolerate much noise. Um, yeah. So it's it's like a um, fault tolerance threshold type of result, 
if the if the noise is below a certain threshold, then then this uh, technique works and we can get rid of it. Um, uh, but the, the, the threshold that we can show is, is, is very small. Um, yes, yeah, so that's um, all I have to to say. Work. So happy to have any more questions. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for a very interesting talks. Okay, so the the floor is open for discussion. Um, please, um, if you want to just unmute your microphones and ask Marco questions. I can start if, if you feel a little shy. So um, you, you um, constructed this um, this uh, advantage circuit based on the magic square. Um, and this is based, well, this is connected to, to contextuality, I guess. And then I'm just wondering whether you could just create a whole family of of advantages like this based on some contextual games and have you thought about this yeah i mean essentially you you just need the game with a with a gap right between classical and quantum uh, winning <laughs> probability um, now magic squares is 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 nice because first of all it can be one perfectly quantum which is uh, certainly yep. makes our lives easier um, and then it, it's very simple and it, it only requires Clifford circuit. So if, if you want this um, construction to go through, as long as you have a, a game that can be played with only Clifford games, then, then you're, then I think, yes, one, one can just plug it in more or less. Um, okay. So can you, can we imagine, for example, I mean, the, the first kind of game that I learned in my life that was better quantum than classical was like breaking the CHSH inequality. Like could one maybe use this? Because I mean, this one is deterministic, right? This one is like, you can always do it quantumly and you will fail classically. But I'm just wondering whether one could get even a simpler construction than that. Um, yes. I'm, I'm just wondering whether if, if you only have a, a separation like that, whether... Hmm. Yeah, I mean, okay, I'm gonna uh, ask. Uh -huh. it's, it's, it's certainly nicer to have the... Full winning probability, but I think one, one could show some separation. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just not sure it would be equivalently strong. Yeah, I guess uh, strong. Yes, but but you because in a sense you want. Mm. Well, maybe that's that's a thing to think after <laughs> afterwards. Uh, I just wanted to ask one, one more very quick thing. You somehow use this idea of um, having random position of the inputs, right? But I guess the whole result would still hold if uh, um, instead of this, you just had this artificial constraint that Ali's input is at the very top and Bob input is at the very bottom, right? That would then normally follow as well. Um, yes, but then you, you kind of make a locality or something. Yeah, 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 I know, I know, I know. But I'm just wondering whether this would work with locality constraints as well. Yes, then you don't need to go through most of the work. Yes, okay. <laughs> you, yeah, you just then you just use like right? You, you see, state okay. that um, they cannot um, uh, communicate mm -hmm. in, in constant okay. depth, but, but you can actually distribute entanglement in constant depth. Yeah. Okay. So this is this is the main um, winning point here that you can distribute entanglement between distant parties in a constant depth. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, are there any other questions? Let me check the chat. Yeah, please, please, Miho. You are muted. Yeah, I, okay, I have uh, yeah some some technical questions. So the so one your your uh, your scheme used a lot uh, before the game, and my question is: Did you use uh, effectively full power of Clifford's gate uh, Clifford gates, or just a subset of it? Uh, like is like our generic are, let's say, all Cleforts or all constant depth Cleforts needed? Uh, uh, let's actually see if we have, maybe I haven't really written down what these. Well, this one just needs Hadamars and C nots. Oh, and C, C gates. Uh, and I guess here we need some Hadamars and swaps. 
So yeah, it's. I mean, it's. I don't see any as subset, uh, even of of Clifford. Yeah. So but I mean, even is, it can be done with real quantum mechanics then, or or not. Maybe the the correction part is more tricky. Um, yeah, maybe the, the correction part might be more uh, there. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. Sure. Uh, okay, uh, a second question. Uh, so like, because uh, uh, those relational problems that you defined, like in both, let's say, ideal and noisy settings, uh, they, uh, if I understood well from, let's say, you, you kind of, you, you cleverly put some non local let's say some non locality or some necessity for adaptivity in redefining of the relation so to verify if uh, output is compatible with the relation you actually would need to uh, run uh, let's say more complicated classical computation right? yes so is it uh, is it uh, known to be impossible that you maybe there is some scheme for which you can like to very uh, uh, for which one can uh, show separation while still uh, requiring just that you can verify the relation locally because it's you know it's a bit uh, I mean I, I don't want to call it cheating but it's like kind of a bit kind of shifting of power to the verification right like what you have now yes I mean that's a, a very good observation. It's something that actually also happens with uh, uh, these auto sampling problems, right? It's it's uh, um, for the Google thing, for example. It's very difficult to actually verify um, whether the, the thing that was produced was was correct or not. Um, and here, it's I mean, at least in this construction, it, it is necessary because otherwise you would violate uh, non-signaling, for example. Um, Right, because obviously you cannot distribute entanglement in uh, in constant depth because uh, you, you you kind of need to communicate also all this inf information that you picked up. Otherwise, if you just trace out all of that, then you would just end up in a in a mixed uh, state, and you couldn't use it for anything. So it's kind of uh, if you if you could do that um, with uh, just by looking at it locally. Um, then, then you, you could use that to mm -hmm. create correlations between faraway particles without uh, faster than the speed of light somehow. But I mean, you. you um, um, so, so it's kind of in that sense, it, it's really necessary that that you look at global information um, for for this kind of construction. And my guess would be that it's, this always kind of has to happen um, with problems that that give you a, a quantum advantage. Um, so, so to verify advantage, you need to uh, go beyond your classical limitations. This is what you ex expect. <laughs> yeah. In the, that the, like you need to go beyond the class, the classical class. That uh, with respect to which you are showing separation, in like quantum classical. Yes, uh, but it's a, it's actually a, a, a good question. So so it would be maybe one can formally show that this is necessary. Um, that the relational problem cannot be locally, um, or if it can be locally checked, then. Then there is no quantum advantage or something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, I would kind of expect this to be true, but but yeah, maybe there's even a simple argument for it, but I, I don't uh, uh, have it. Sure, uh, sure, thanks. Are we have any other questions from other members of the public? Um, I'm going to ask one more then, just waiting. Don't feel shy, please. Um, the, you use the quantum error correcting code there, and I'm just wondering, you, you use this surface code like this, where you measure in the bulk and everything. So I was just wondering whether, and you say you can do this in constant depth, but I was just wondering uh, whether this constant depends on the distance of the code, for example. 
it should somehow depend, right? I guess, or or is it or is it again just shifted from the depth to the number of qubits? Yeah, um, the distance. I mean, obviously, if you look at the picture, uh, the distance one, of yes. the code has to be has to do with the, the surface area, right? Yes. Um, so obviously, then you also get more bulk. Uh, so you need more ancilla qubits that you measure. Yes. Um, but it's constant there because I guess it's it's just yeah because the, those ancillas are only interacting with like you put like CZs in, like, it's like a graph state right I guess yeah this is a graph state so 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 actually creating it is very efficient mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so, then you so, just so, measure them uh, okay so so the only thing that okay so the only thing it doesn't scale well enough is well okay so you kind of keep the, the constant depth but for the price of putting a lot of ancilla qubits. Um, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it's kind of okay, one important thing that I didn't really talk about is that this whole construction then can be done in in three dimensions, right? Because essentially, mm -hmm. um, each location um, is a, is a two two dimensional surface code where you only need uh, like local interactions. For yes. Uh, gates and then um, and then you have the third dimension with these ancillas which is the time kind of yeah you use to to create right. the ground state or yeah I mean it actually directly creates the entangled state um, mm -hmm. this I mean, there, there would be others to just get the ground state but this directly creates an entangled state between two sides. Mm -hmm. So this means the whole thing can be done in a 3D code or a 3D um, yeah. geometry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hey, um, okay, just just the final observation. You uh, maybe a stupid one. You said that this work was a little bit different than your other works on finite resources, but I think in a sense one can see that the, that one can see this is a you know it's a finite length circuit, right? You don't have infinitely many quantum gates. You, you still deal with finite resources and see what you can do. In a sense, yes, yes. But the techniques are very different. Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I have to say that, I mean, all the error correction stuff that, that comes from from uh, Sergey and, and Robert, mm. I was mostly involved in the, in the first part, the noises. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, because that that uses some some ideas I'm very familiar with. <laughs> um, yes. um, all right, so it's a uh, last moment to to ask Marco uh, any question. Oh yes, please, 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 uh, Michal. Yeah, I I just have some down to the earth uh, questions for a change. So uh, you uh, you you gave this uh, construction when there are errors, but I uh, I wonder what is you mentioned that the dependence on the error probability is bad but you didn't sort of show how how bad it is in a sense if i maybe i missed it like uh, yeah um so or i mean the dependence the is one? not bad in a sense that as long as your error is below a threshold then all the overhead you you get is kind of it doesn't grow with with n right okay. or certainly Certainly, the, the the depth doesn't grow with n. And the so in the, sense is the, the one corresponding to the corresponding, I know, surface code or this modification of surface code that we're discussing. Yes, and I think the the size of the code is also at most linear. In in no, it should be constant. It, it's constant uh, as a function of of. Um, of the error parameter. I mean, if the error is larger, then you need a larger code, obviously. Uh, sure, but, it will but just again. if I can ask, so just very down, like how small the uh, in the current construction, how small the error needs to be? Like, uh, I, I guess in the simplest uh, model, when you know independent error, right? Like, is it zero point? Like, point no, of... no, it's it's. Uh, I mean, our argument is is not. It's also not optimized for it, but I, I, we don't even write down. I see. I see. A value. It's just it's come. Uh, there exists a threshold. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Still, very nice result. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks.
Okay, thanks a lot then uh, for giving the talk and attending our colloquium. And we of course invite you to attend the other ones that happen every month. I can send you a link later. Um, sure. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Michal, do you want to say the final words? <laughs> You're the host today, so yeah. Well, okay. Well, you are the big host. No, but many well. thanks, Marco, for, for, yes. for coming. Yeah, yeah thanks. Was, it was a pleasure. That was a nice way to understand this result instead of reading the whole paper. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, that's the well, that's the purpose of this colloquia, no? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot.